Okay, it's just after 10, so I think we'll get started and hopefully a few other folks will be joining. Um, folks are logging in as we speak. So good morning um, and welcome to this webinar presented by the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership. Our theme today is Oaks in New England Forests, Keystones for Biodiversity and Resiliency. And we're excited to have two guest speakers today who will be focusing on research related to oaks and biodiversity, as well as applied science and resources focusing on how to care for our oaks into the future. My name is Lisa Hayden and I'm the Outreach Manager for New England Forestry Foundation. Uh, this is a nonprofit focused on land conservation and sustainable forestry. And I'm hosting today in my liaison role as administrative agent for the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership. Also assisting today in the background is Forest Policy Fellow Connor Rocket from NEF and Kate Conlin, Chair of the Partnership's Forest Conservation Standing Committee. And before we get started, I just wanna briefly mention some logistics about our uh, Zoom webinar format that we're using today. All attendees will be muted except for the speakers and hosts but we welcome your questions or comments in the chat box. Um, and if you're not so familiar with Zoom, if you look to the bottom of your screen, there should be a green, uh, sorry, not green, <laughs> just it's a white button that says chat. And if you click there, it'll open up a window and you can um, enter your cursor in and, and type in uh, your questions into that box. Um, and we're planning to take a few brief questions after the first speaker, but we'll leave the bulk of the time for questions at the end of the webinar. And hopefully we'll also have some time for um, discussion between the speakers to address your questions. Also today's webinar is being recorded with captioning and a link to the video will be shared in a follow-up email. And uh, before turning to our speakers, I'd like to introduce Beth Gershman, Beth Gershman of Conway. Here she is, back again, <laughs> Chair of the Education Outreach and Research Standing Committee of the Partnership, just to say a few words on behalf of the organization. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, it's great to see you all here today. This is the first of what we hope are many educational events for landowners, municipalities, forest land management professionals, and the general public. The Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership is currently funded through state targeted funds from Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts. Grant funded projects are also through federal, state and private monies. If you have an idea or request for future educational programs, please get in touch with us through our website, mohawktrailwoodlandspartnership.org. The partnership area consists of 21 towns in Western Franklin and Northern Berkshire counties. Our goals include working with landowners to permanently protect forested land, and to encourage sustainable management practices, increasing natural resource-based economic development and employment through outdoor recreation and tourism and development of local wood products, improving fiscal stability of municipalities with funding for services related to outdoor recreation, management of town-owned forests, and assistance with climate resiliency programs. Thanks for attending our program today. Great. Thank you, Beth. And now I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, so Desiree, if you want to be getting your slides queued up uh, while I introduce you. Good morning. Dr. Desiree Narango is David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellow and postdoctoral researcher at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, as well as the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station. She has a PhD in entomology and wildlife ecology from the University of Delaware and an MS in Natural Resources from Ohio State University. Desiree's research focuses on understanding wildlife habitat relationships and plant-animal interactions in novel human-dominated landscapes. Her ultimate goal is to find data-driven conservation solutions for land managers to help preserve biodiversity and species interactions in our rapidly changing world. Her current research focuses on understanding tree preferences and diet relationships of insectivorous migratory birds using forests throughout New England. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Desiree. Thank you. I got to unmute there. <laughs> 
Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Lisa. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm really excited for this opportunity to share with you a little bit about what I've learned about the incredible importance of oak trees to biodiversity. Uh, because, you know, as a as someone who studies uh, species interactions, um, as an ecologist, I usually do so from the perspective of the entire plant or tree community. Uh, but throughout my work, especially in recent years, there's been this constant thread where oak trees are uh, come up again and again as being beyond valuable for wildlife habitat. And so it's become really more of a central focus of my work and my interests in recent years. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what kind of wildlife diversity that oaks support, the vast variety of wildlife that's out there, and provide to you a little bit of evidence for their incredible value for ecosystem function in New England. Um, this is a quote that many people have heard lots of times, is that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. And this is incredibly true because the benefits of every tree that you plant will be experienced long after you're gone. Uh, the trees that you add to the landscape now will experience hundreds of years of growth, hundreds of years of stability, and then hundreds of years of decline before their eventual death. So really that tree that you plant is providing centuries of support for local ecosystems. It's a real legacy. Uh, so the choice you make in what trees you plant or how you manage them really matters in the long run. And we all know that trees vary in how they're adapted to local conditions, um, how resilient they are, or how they provision to climate adaptation, and of course, how they support your own personal needs and values as well. And so this is where I come in. As an ecologist, I really want to do my part to provide the quantitative data that you need to make sure that biodiversity conservation is a part of that equation as well. Because from my perspective, one of the primary ways that people can manage wildlife habitat is through the ways that they cultivate trees and plants. From the ones that you cut down, the ones that you plant in their place, the mature trees that you retain, each one of those seemingly small decisions has had the additive effect of completely transforming the tree communities that have survived to occupy the present day. For example, in parts of New England, tree communities have shifted dramatically from a primarily oak-dominated forest to one that is now maple-dominated since European colonization. And oaks are now down to only 10% of the forest throughout the region. And these changes to forest communities have important implications for wildlife habitat, but we really only scratched the surface of the importance of individual tree species and in genera to these relationships. Um, in several indigenous cultures, oaks have been described as the tree of life, and I think that that's an incredibly accurate and beautiful description of this tree. I also want to acknowledge that celebrating the value of oak trees for biodiversity is not a new idea. It's rooted in indigenous knowledge because these peoples have known about the tremendous value of oaks for people and wildlife for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I acknowledge that. Um, and I also want to share with you some of the fantastic diversity of oak trees that I've learned about. And first, we'll talk about some of the wildlife that depend on oak leaves for their resources. And we'll start by talking about our insect communities, which turns out that more than 90% of our plant-eating insects are specialists for some, at, uh, to some degree. And what that means is that um, these insect species have adapted over evolutionary time to feed on very particular host plants. And this is because they've overcome those nasty defensive chemical compounds that are found in the leaf. They also adapt to the uh, morphology of the plant or the phenology, the timing of that plant as well. And so that we know that when insects jump to oak trees and we're able to take advantage and overcome the tannins that are found in the leaf, that they then radiated into a tremendous diversity of uh, plant-reliant insects from our hemipterans, the leafhoppers, beetles, and of course, lepidopterans, our butterflies and moths. And for, for our moths, uh, the numbers are extremely striking in diversity. So Massachusetts supports at least 2,200 and 
49 different species of moth trees, the genus Quercus alone supports at least 511 of those species, or 23% of the moth and butterfly biodiversity that's out there. And these species species have fantastic different kinds of colors and beautiful uh, morphologies like um, the checkered fringe prominent here on the left, the skiff moth in the middle, and our variable oak moth. Just beautiful, amazing critters that although, you know, they eventually turn into moths and butterflies, they spend the majority of their life cycle relying on the trees that they feed on. And so these oak trees are incredibly important for supporting those insect populations. Um, these oak trees are also supporting several species of charismatic large luna moth and of course our spiny oakworm, which is specialized for some of our scrub oaks. Our oaks are supporting 14 species of Massachusetts butterflies, including the viceroy, the white admiral, and the eastern tiger swallowtail. And although we can plant flowers all over the place and, and conserve meadows for these butterflies when they're in their adult form, they spend just a small portion of their time in that form. Again, most of their life cycle is spent as caterpillars feeding on plants. Our oaks support lots of different kinds of insect diversity and our galls, which can be beautiful and amazing in their own right. We have more than 800 species of oak galls that are found on our oak trees. And our oaks are also supporting our nocturnal symphonies and cases of katydids and cicadas, you can thank your oak trees for, for providing resources and habitat for these species because your summers just would not sound the same without them. And of course, because of all this insect diversity, we also have lots and lots of insectivore diversity like neuropteran uh, lacewings, spiders, and of course, our songbirds who from across the globe, more than 70% of our songbirds are mostly insectivorous throughout their life cycle. So more than 50% of their diet is reliant on insects. Um, so in this way, we need to conserve the trees that conserve our insect diversity, which is very intimately related to our bird conservation as well. Because oaks are wind pollinated, we don't actually we don't often think of them as being uh, very important for our pollinators. Uh, but recently, I've come across some really interesting papers uh, that kind of refute that idea. Um, so actually, for some of our bee species and other pollinators, uh, like Adrena and Osmia, two uh, types of solitary bees, uh, researchers uh, from back in the day have found that more than 90% of the pollen that they're provisioning their brood was coming from oak trees. And this is really interesting because even though oak trees aren't necessarily relying on um, and bees and other pollinators for reproduction, the bees are relying on them because these are really important uh, resources to feed their young in order to complete their life cycles. And as we get more advanced in our technologies like DNA barcoding to figure out these interactions between bees and their pollen, I'm very confident that we'll find many more species that are relying on this nutrient-rich pollen from oak trees. One of the most apparent food resources that are provided by oaks are, of course, the acorns. Um, and in fact, if we look across the United States, at least 96 different species of vertebrates are relying on acorns. And this is just a tremendous amass of nutrient-rich food that erupts into the landscape. And so lots of species have adapted to take advantage of this wonderful food. Um, of course, this includes lots of different kinds of bird species like our jays that assist in oak dispersal by taking acorns all over the landscape. Our woodpeckers are also uh, both dispersing seeds and relying on them to survive the winter. But oak acorns are also really important to some species that we wouldn't quite think of as being uh, acorn uh, users like our waterfowl, wood ducks, also our rails. Um, and of course, many game bird species like turkeys, grouse, and quails comes out. 
Um, in addition to these large species, there's also a lot of smaller songbirds that rely on acorns as well. Um, in fact, I, before I got my PhD, I worked on a species called the rusty blackbird, which is declining by over 90%. It's a species of, of conservation concern in New England. And we had many uh, observations of rusty blackbirds eating oak acorns that had fallen into puddles because at that point, the acorn was able to be teased apart to get that nutritious meat inside. Um, and in this study by Martin in uh, 1951, he had documented many different passerine songbirds that rely on acorns and things that you wouldn't think of like goldfinches, house finches, Carolina wrens, and titmice. Our acorns are also supporting uh, lots of mammalian diversity as well, like our squirrels and our mice that we know have these boom and bust cycles that occur in uh, accordance with acorn masting. And then our, our bear and our deer um, and other herbivores that are relying on these acorns in order to make it through the winter. So just a vast variety of mammalian diversity relies on that food source. In addition to the acorns and the leaves and the pollen, there's many species that rely on oak leaf litter. Oaks produce tremendous volumes of leaf litter that stick around on the forest floor for a long period of time. And this is a really important resource. Again, for our in intact leaf litter for overwintering habitat, like our luna moths that make their cocoons in that leaf litter, as well as our, our queen bumblebees that we need to initiate colonies the next year, they all bury into the leaf litter under oak trees in order to complete the overwintering period. We also have some interesting butterfly species like the red banded hair streak that we know feeds only on dead oak leaves. So it's not just that they need the oak leaves, they need them in a certain life stage as well. They only use them when they're dead. And so without the oak trees, we wouldn't have this fantastic uh, uh, hair streak butterfly as well. Oak trees are also called eversiduous trees, which is a very fancy term, which means that the leaves are staying on uh, well past senescence. And so by oak trees, is retaining these leaves on their trees. Not only does it deter herbivory so that the tree can be more resilient, but it also provides really important overwintering habitat uh, and shelter from cold and weather for insects, as well as for um, species that, uh, that winter here in New England, like the golden crown kinglet. Um, and actually, when we, when we look at the diets of uh, golden crown kinglets, which forage primarily in these dead leaves, we see that more than 90% of their diet are insects, even in the dead of winter. And of course, leaf litter provides tremendous important habitat to support our beneficial predators, like our carabid beetles that are keeping populations of pest insects down and provide important foraging substrates for our birds. And again, Despite you know, it being cold and snowy up here in New England, many of our bird species are relying on insects even in the overwintering period. And so uh, oak trees are supporting tremendous moths and butterflies and birds and bees and beetles and mammals and so much more. Uh, but on top of all of this biodiversity value, they're also, they also have been supporting us for millennia by providing timber and fuel uh, they have incredible mut mutualisms with edible fungi like hen of the woods. They also store more carbon than any other woody uh, plant group across the world, more than 2.98 billion metric tons of carbon. And they provide superior shade for uh, cooling us during the hot summer months, prevent soil erosion, and also absorb massive amounts of air pollution. So these trees are just doing so much with everyone that's planted. And so I would argue that oaks are really just a super tree because when we want to find synergies between climate adaptation, biodiversity conservation, and our personal health and well being, you can't go wrong with having oak trees on your property. 
And so a lot of my research, you know, these are more descriptive ways of saying why oak trees are important, but a lot of my work has in recent years has started to quantify uh, to what extent are oaks important, both in New England, but also beyond and across the United States. Um, and for most of this work, I've focused primarily on looking at this tritrophic relationship between oak trees and, and other trees in our ecosystems, uh, insects and arthropods like our caterpillars and our spiders and our insect eating birds as well. So before I shared with you that oak trees are supporting um, at least 511 different caterpillar species in Massachusetts, but the important thing to keep in mind is that that amount of caterpillar diversity is really uncommon on trees. And when we look at entire native tree communities, they can vary quite a lot in the amount of caterpillar diversity that they support. Uh, so in contrast, tulip trees um, in, in Massachusetts are only supporting about 10 species. And actually they only support 10 or less caterpillar species, no matter where you go in the tulip tree distribution. And so um, my colleagues and I were really interested in trying to quantify the species interactions between oaks and other uh, plants in, um, in different communities across the United States. And so I had this really uh, kind of fortunate opportunity um, to work with Doug Tallamy, who was my PhD advisor, and my colleague Kimberly Shropshire, who put tons and tons of work into amassing a gigantic database of plant caterpillar interactions across the United States looking at more than 24,000 different interactions from more than 3,600 um, historical host plant pub publications. So these are uh, entomological literature where people have recorded plants that they found different caterpillar species on, um, and then from more than 2,000 different plant genera. And so what we found is that when we look across the United States, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Massachusetts or Texas or Ohio or Washington state, we see that the distributions of species interactions are consistently skewed, where most of the tree community and the plant community is supporting very little of that caterpillar diversity. And there's just a handful of plant genera that are supporting the lion's share of those of that caterpillar diversity. And I should also mention that most of the, all of this work is at the genera level for, uh, for trees. And that's because that's the level that we have information on having that nuanced species level interaction data for caterpillars is just not um, available at the scale, at the continental scale that we were trying to make with this research. And so um, it turns out that when you look across the United States, just 14% of our plants are supporting more than 90% of the caterpillar species that are out there. But when we looked at the, uh, the, the identities of the plants that were supporting most of the cat caterpillar diversity, we were seeing the same trees come out again and again. And in this case, for both Arizona and Michigan, oaks are consistently on top. And so uh, when we look at the average amount of caterpillar diversity that oak trees support, we see that they're above and beyond um, more beneficial than any other tree uh, that we studied, supporting on average more than 20% of the caterpillar diversity. And so going from that, we wanted to try to uh, uh, quantify the effect of having oak trees in a landscape or alternatively, what would happen if we took oak trees out of a habitat? How would that affect the species interactions with caterpillars? And so we use these methods to basically simulate if we took oak trees out, how many species uh, would lose an interaction? How many species would we lose entirely? And how would that affect stability of these food webs as well? And we used all of these different metrics in a way to just score different plants in terms of their contribution to food webs. And what we found out is that across the United States, there were about 20 different uh, uh, woody plants that supported above average scores of contributions to plant caterpillar diversity. And of those 20, only about 10 were considered outliers and oaks were above and beyond, had the highest score across the entire continental US. And so because of this disproportionately high score, we called these plants keystone species, which is another way of saying that 
these trees are a key component of supporting the rest of the food web in a way that if we took out oak trees, that we would lose all of those interactions and the foundation of the food web um, for other species. Of course, all of this data was uh, based on host plant literature records, um, not actually going out in the field and sampling caterpillars. And so we wanted to make sure that the scores that we derived from that data science were also reflective of what we would find if we did field sampling. So we compared Pennsylvania hedgerow scores of caterpillars that we found on about 20 different types of trees with scores that we derived from this host plant literature. And what we found, so here this dash line is a one-to-one -one relationship if they were perfectly aligned. And our scores were extremely correlated with one another. And primarily this is due to most of the tree species not supporting very much caterpillar diversity, abundance, or biomass at all. Uh, and, our, and our quercus, our oaks up here on the top, really driving that relationship because they have high scores both from the literature and from in the field. They're always supporting most of the caterpillar diversity and abundance. Um, at this point in the talk, you might be like, oh wow, you're talking a lot about caterpillars, but I actually don't want caterpillars on my tree. And so this is where I'm going to talk about, you know, some of the other benefits of oak trees. So in addition to supporting a lot of caterpillar diversity, I also had this wonderful undergrad who looked at uh, survival of caterpillars as well. And so what he found is that no matter what season that you're in, spring, summer, or fall, oak, uh, caterpillars that are found on oak trees are suffering the highest mortality. So they have the most predators that are on these trees that are helping to keep those caterpillar populations down so that they don't overwhelm that tree and cause any negative effects. And that is what we want. We want to have food webs that are both diverse but also stable. And so what was the primary predator that was feeding on these clay caterpillar models that uh, Garrison put out? They were primarily birds um, because for birds, caterp caterpillars are an incredibly important food resource. And we see again and again in the literatures that birds tend to prefer caterpillars over other food resources, in part because they have really high protein, which is important for growing bones and feathers. They have really high calories, which is important for um, efficiency, a little power packet of food. And they have really high carotenoids, which is important for immune function. And so we see that birds are always kind of keying into the places where they can find lots of caterpillar food resources. And birds are not the only ones that rely on caterpillars. In fact, caterpillars are the key component that bridges the plant community to the rest of the terrestrial food web, feeding things like beetles, chipmunks, spiders, frogs, salamanders, lots of things rely on caterpillars. And so if, if trees vary in the amount of caterpillars that they support, we wanted to test whether birds could actually recognize that that was an important food resource for them in their foraging while they're feeding their young. And so I did a study that was published in 2017 focusing on the Carolina chickadee, which is the cousin to your black cap chickadee up here. And we used, again, these literature by the number of caterpillar species that are found on, on each plant to see how well that birds preferred them. And what we found was this beautiful linear relationship in native plants where the more caterpillar species that a bird supports, the more that these chickadees are preferring them relative to other trees in the landscape. And again, um, our oak trees, which in the mid-Atlantic are supporting about 532 caterpillar species, were above and beyond the most preferred tree uh, that these birds foraged in to feed their young, constituting um, more than 28% of the observations throughout the, um, the, the two years of this study. And so while we were um, following these chickadees around to see where they're foraging, we were also seeing a tremendous diversity of other birds that were in the process of their spring migration. So these were birds that didn't necessarily breed in the areas that we were studying, but they were making their way from the Amazonian 
uh, rainforests up to the boreal forests of Canada. And they have to find important food resources um, along the way. And this is a really important component of New England forests, of supporting all of these migratory birds making their way to the basket of boreal forests. Um, and so while we were studying these oak trees and following these chickadees around, we ended up documenting more than 50 different species of migratory bird and over 20 different species of warbler. And again, I didn't mention this, but this is in urban areas in Washington, D.C., where I, where I studied these chickadees. And so it was really kind of eye-opening to see all of this tremendous uh, species of conservation concern that we're using these trees. And the majority of of observations that we had of these migratory birds were happening in these large mature oaking um, um, all of all of the migratory bird diversity as well. And so um, during that study, I was focused on chickadees. So I didn't quantify the amount of observations of migratory birds, but fortunately, one of my colleagues, Eric Wood, has done this in the forests of Wisconsin. And so he looked at eight migratory insectivorous birds, including warblers, vireos, and gnat catchers. And here he found that compared to relative um, availability, that oak trees, both red oak and white oak, were strongly, strongly preferred relative than any other deciduous woody tree that was in their forest communities. So it was very clear from Eric's study that these particular trees were doing the lion's share of supporting most of the foraging re and diet resources for these insectivorous birds during migration. And there's been lots of other studies in New England and beyond that has also looked at breeding birds that find that our, um, our insect eating birds are preferring these oak trees for foraging. They also prefer areas with high dominance of oak trees for, uh, for breeding and having their territories. Um, so they're really just an incredibly important resource for supporting the insect community, which then supports this insect eating bird. Um, some of my current research is headed is that we know that these trees are supporting lots of caterpillars and other insects. We know that birds like to prefer to forage on these oak trees, but since oaks are declining throughout New England, especially in our urban and other human dominated area, we wanna know whether taking out the oak dominance of those forest communities is influencing the diversity, nutrition, and condition of these insectivorous birds, especially when uh, during migration. So in Springfield, Massachusetts, I'm currently uh, catching birds uh, in areas that vary in oak dominance so that we can look at both diet and uh, uh, plasma metabolites as a measure of condition. And then uh, the, the other kind of aspect of my work that I'm currently uh, focusing on is then taking what we learn at a local scale and expanding that to a landscape scale. And so we've been using basal area tree predictions from forest service data, linking that with caterpillar data that's spatially explicit so that we can look at how food is distributed across the landscape. And so this is kind of, this is a kind of a new way of looking at how and how food is distributed for birds so that we can then link that to bird community data to, um, to see whether we can identify hotspots for conserving insectivorous birds throughout the region. So that's all I have for you. I know I'm running a little bit on time, but my uh, take home message for you today is that oaks support a vast array of fantastic wildlife. Oaks, again, are our keystone species for supporting both insect food webs as well as bird food webs. And we have more work to do to look at that. And finally, that oak management can create synergies between uh, biodiversity conservation, climate adaptation, and human well-being. And so I encourage you from this talk to consider oaks the tree of life, possibly the most important broadleaf tree in the country, and, that, and to think about what your part can be in future conservation through the way that you manage your tree communities. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions that you have, and thank you so much for your time today. Wonderful. Thank you, Desiree. That was great. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come up in the chat. Um, a few of them, I think, might be addressed by our next speaker. So if not, we will come back to them. But um, one question uh, here. Uh, whoops, I just lost it. <laughs> um, okay, I, 
I have noticed oak shot increase a lot on the oak leaves found in the hill towns. Can you speak about that at all? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, the questioner asks, I have noticed oak shot. And oak shot? Yes. And oh, maybe, if you're maybe that's a New England that, term. Can describe. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you describe what you mean by that? Let's see if they have responded. Um, Levi, if you want to add some more detail about that. If you're speaking okay. about herbivory, uh, yeah, oh, lots so of little holes. Okay, I thought so. Yes, got that. Okay. I was wondering if that was like a New England term. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so herbivory, so when you see holes in, in leaves, it can come from a lot of different resource, uh, sources. It can be chewing from caterpillars. It can be uh, even bees will take leaves to go, uh, and ants will take holes out of leaves to go um, make their nest. Uh, most of it is, um, and of course, there's herbivory from, from mammals as well. And so, you know, I would encourage you to think about oak shot as not a bad thing, right? If we have trees that are completely defol defoliated, like in um, LDD moth, Lamantria, uh, that's a bad thing. That's not good for oak trees. But a little bit of herbivory is okay. And what we want to do is have insect populations on those trees and have bird populations that will help keep that insect population down to a reasonable level. Um, in our hill towns, we have more moth diversity than I've ever experienced in my life. And um, so that's a good thing, though. Like, that's a really good thing. Our oaks are doing great um, when our invasive species aren't out of control. Um, and so it could be just the tremendous diversity that we have in our rural areas, and that's something to be celebrated. Right. Um, so there's one other question here that maybe you can touch on. I think Logan may address this too, but uh, the question is what particular invasives, plants or insects, et cetera, are putting oaks at risk in our region? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the big one is LDD moth, uh, Lamantria dispar, which is um, um, a species of um, invasive caterpillar uh, that can completely defoliate uh, oak trees. Um, they can be kept down by a fungus, but um, but when they do get out of control, they can they can cause some um, tremendous effects on the nutrition of our oak trees as well. There's also um, invasive um, um, uh, oak disease that 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 can cause tremendous effects. And and I'm not an expert on pests and pathogens. Um, I do know that there are invasive insects that are found on oak trees that aren't doing very much at all. They're, they're, they're pretty benign. Um, and when we actually sample the insects that are on oak trees, on healthy oak trees, the majority of insects uh, that we find on them are native beneficial species. Um, so in absence of, of your oak experiencing um, tremendous health uh, uh, um, effects from an overwhelming number of insects, um, of invasive insects, uh, your trees are, are, are perfectly fine in most cases. We do have two, um, two questions that are asking how you feel about the recent oak cutting in Wendell State Forest. I don't know if you're familiar with that um, specific harvest and if you can speak about that at all. So I can't speak specifically about that because I don't know the context of how the oaks um, are being management managed at Wendell. I don't live too far from it, but I know that's been of concern in the community. Um, the thing about oak trees is that a lot of them, especially white oaks, depend. Um, they're they're very shade intolerant, and in previous eco, you know, in historical ecosystems oaks were able to get huge so that they eventually died and had a huge canopy gaps and huge amounts of sunlight that then allowed the next generation of oaks to come up. And unfortunately, with the way that we manage forest habitat, how young our forests are in New England, we just don't have that level of disturbance anymore. And so, um, although I'm not going to speak specifically about Wendell, I will say that what we need to do is have not just you know, more oak trees, we need to have a diversity of structure in those forests as well, which includes both mature trees, but also uh, space for the next generation to come up as well, because that will create forests that are more resilient to the future. Great. 
And I think we'll just take one more question here before we turn over to our next speaker. Um, but Lori is asking, we are planning to plant red and white oak in Rowe, Massachusetts. White oak is a more southern tree in New England. Is Rowe too far north for them to reliably survive? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh gosh, <laughs> so this is my caveat where I say that I'm only a recent transplant to New England, so I don't know where that is. <laughs> um, I will say that, um, you know, oak, white oaks, um, which are more shade intolerant, uh, you know, when we look among different oak species, you know, especially as an entomologist, white oaks are always on top. They're always supporting just amazing bird diversity and insect diversity. And when we look at the number of birds that are foraging on white oaks, the amount of insects that we find on, on white oaks, they, they are on top. Um, you know, whether it's going to be fit in your particular situation in your ecosystem would be something to talk to a local manager or an arborist about because in addition to your latitude, you might be like close to a city or, uh, you know, in an area with poor soil. So in order to figure out what oak is best fit for you, it'd be best to talk to somebody more specific about your conditions. And the last thing that I want to touch on is that the Forest Service is very interested in how uh, a future, how can we have oak management into a future climate? And so this includes not just, you know, do we have to think about southerly species and how oaks are going to increase in um, in latitude in the coming century? We know that oaks are, um, are I don't want to use the word invading, but colonizing uh, ecosystems that they haven't before, like in the forests of Hubbard Brook. Um, but we also have a wide variety of different oak genotypes from different uh, areas. And so um, some of the folks that are thinking very heavily about climate adaptation are thinking about oak plantings into the future for uh, what New England will, is like now, but also what it'll be like in 100 years. And so hopefully we can add some biodiversity perspectives from that work as well. Great. But go for white oaks because they're great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Desiree, so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and we're going to turn now to our next speaker to be sure we have enough time. So, um, Logan, if you want to be um, loading up your slides, and I will introduce you. Um, we're welcoming today Logan Johnson, who is Northeast Region Coordinator for the Forest Stewards Guild, who will be discussing a new oak resiliency assessment tool for Southern New England forests. And he's hopefully going to address some of the questions that have come up to through his um, presentation. Logan is excited to work with people interested in helping others discover the forest as a sustainable natural resource that communities depend on. Raised in rural Washington County, Maine, Logan earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Master of Forestry degree from the University of Maine. His experience includes an 11-month AmeriCorps service term as a land stewardship coordinator for Buzzards Bay Coalition in New Bedford, Massachusetts. His work with the Guild focuses on woodland owner outreach, forest climate change resiliency, and fire science. And just a reminder, you can uh, type your questions into the chat for Logan as well. And um, take it away, Logan. Great, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thanks to everyone at the New England Forestry Foundation and the Mohawk Trail Woodland Partnership for um, inviting me to speak today. And I also, before I get started, wanted to say I appreciate Desiree's acknowledgement of indigenous peoples and their ongoing relationship with oak um, in our forests. Um, so today I'll be talking about this oak, increasing oak resiliency partnership um, in Southern New England. Um, first, I'll orient you to the Forest Stewards Guild, who we are and what we do, and then primarily we'll discuss why we're focusing on increasing oak resiliency um, and what we are doing to move the needle to promote oak across the landscape. So the Forest Stewards Guild is a national nonprofit organization that focuses on making ecologically, economically, and socially responsible forestry the professional standard. Our mission is to practice and promote forestry that maintains the integrity of forest ecosystems and the human communities dependent upon them. And we achieve this mission through a combination of research, policy analysis, training, education, to some degree advocacy and boots on the ground action. And in the Northeast, that boots on the ground action comes in the form of collaborations like this increasing oak resiliency um, in Southern New England project. 
we're somewhat unique in the environmental nonprofit sector, um, as we have both a professional membership where we have over 700 members nationally who um, uh, of conform to a set of six guiding principles. Um, and these are made up mostly of natural resource professionals and uh, foresters, um, but we also have affiliate members as landowners and student members. Um, and as a guild member, one of the one makes the commitment to take on a series of guiding stewardship principles, as I mentioned, in their approach to forest management. And the most important principle is what we call the first duty principle, which states uh, it is our first duty as a forest or landowner uh, is to the forest in its future. And so we are a national program. Our Northeast office is located in Portland, Maine, where I'm calling in from, but we also have offices in Asheville, North Carolina, um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, Oregon and Santa Fe, New Mexico is where we are headquartered. Um, some of our Northeast programs include uh, Woodland Owner Outreach, which includes this Oak Resiliency Project we'll discuss today. We also do a lot of work with the Women Owning Woodlands Network nationally, um, Forestry for the Birds programs in Maine specifically and beyond. Um, we focused on creating climate change community of practices. We do a lot of work with the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange to talk about wildfires and prescribed fires in um, northeastern forests um, in responding to emerald ash borer and other invasive uh, insects as they come through our region. So why oak? Why are we focusing on oak today? And just to frame the conversation, I want to define what is resi resilience. And resilience is actions that focus on increasing the capacity of the ecosystem to cope with climate change and other stressors while maintaining its fundamental characteristic. So keeping oak forests is oak forests for the, for the long term. So why oak? 70% um, of forests of Southern New England are dominated by oaks. Um, this forest type, however, faces pressures that compromise its long-term health and ability to regenerate. Current threats include heavy deer herbivory and defoliation from Lymantria dispar. Um, and I'll say this term once, Lymantria dispar is formerly known as gypsy moth. Um, the Entomological Society of America has retired this term because of its derogatory um, derogatory phrase for the Romani people of Eastern Europe. And so uh, they are working on finding a new common name, but for the duration of this presentation, I'll refer to the moth as Lymantria dispar. Um, while trends of seasonal drought and climate change pressures compound other disturbance factors, widespread canopy mortality impacts wildlife species that depend on oaks for food and habitat, causes safety hazards and residential neighborhoods or on roadsides and can deal a significant financial blow to private landowners who are relying on oak for income. Um, amid these contemporary threats, civil culture prescriptions once worked may now fail to secure healthy oak regeneration and new approaches are needed. And what I mean by that is we need to secure the next generation of oak as well as focus on maintaining the oak on the landscape today. Compounding these issues, 70% of the forests are dominated by oaks. Most of the region's forests, 70%, consist of primarily small parcels owned by family forest owners and individuals. Thus, the landscape scale shift depends on effective landowner outreach and education. Um, if landowners' primary goals may include timber management, recreation, wildlife habitat, legacy, carbon, or a combination of these outcomes. And we need to focus on uh, balancing these objectives over the long term. And given the ecological importance of oak species in the region's forests, all land management approaches stand to gain by integrating measures to promote the long-term resiliency of this forest type. And I'm just going to paraphrase a quote from one of our partners on this project, Tom Worthley of the Uni University of Connecticut's Ag um, Cooperative Extension Program. Tom says, if you manage for oak, you'll get oak in the maple, birch, and beech in the forest. But if you don't manage for oak, you'll only get the maple, birch, and beech in the forest. And so we really need to be creating space for oak in our forests. Um, looking at these pictures that are here on the left is um, a tree that's being defoliated by Lymantria dispar. In the center is um, a sp sprout stumps being being browsed by deer and on the right is just a stand that has been impacted severely by Lymantria dispar, but looking at the system as a whole. We want the young trees, we want the older trees, and we want the landscape as a whole to be resilient to these stresses. So our project goals um, with support from the United States Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, 
the landscape scale restoration program. Uh, we are working with state agencies and nonprofit partners in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts to increase resiliency in Southern New England's Oaks Forest. Through this collaborative initiative, um, including a regional professional learning exchange, landowner stewardship summits, and hands-on resiliency assessment tools, um, we aim to increase forest stewardship activities that support oak resiliency across the landscape, empower natural resource professionals with tools for assessing oak forest health, build landowner awareness of regeneration challenges and solutions, and foster communication between states and agencies about strategies for addressing oak forest resiliency and regeneration challenges. And so some of our partners um, are listed here, the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, um, my Mass Con Woods and Massachusetts uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife, also known as Mass Wildlife, uh, as we focus on Massachusetts today. But in Connecticut, the Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy and Protection, uh, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, Connecticut Forest and Parts Association, Yukon College of Agriculture, uh, health and Natural Resources Extension in the Connecticut Agriculture Experimental Station. Uh, and then in Rhode Island, Providence Water, the Rhode Island Div Department of Environmental Management, Rhode Island Wood Partnership, and Sweet Birch Consulting. So what are the activities that we're doing to um, increase this oak resiliency across the landscape? Um, so far, I've outlined who the Forest Stewards Guild is, why we are focusing on oak and our project goals. Um, so for the rest of my time, I'll be focusing on these activities, which include uh, workshops for, for professionals, educational events for landowners, this oak resiliency assessment tool that is primarily for professionals, but somebody who is really engaged as a landowner would probably be able to benefit from using the tool as well. And then our overall regional oak forest resiliency synthesis. So workshops for professionals. These are designed for natural resource professionals, including foresters and wildlife biologists, to discuss method, methods and strategies for regenerating oak. Um, we've collaborated to deliver workshops and field tours to members of the Yankee Division of the Society of American Foresters. Society of American Foresters, or SAF, is the largest professional membership association for foresters and other natural resource professionals. Um, the Yankee Division is comprised of SAF members from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. We've held many workshops um, with them and have plans to do more in the future. Um, these also include demonstration areas and field tours. Um, pictured above is Christopher Riley of Sweet Birch Consulting, LLC, who is a key contractor on this project with the Guild. Um, at North across a wildlife sanctuary owned property in Wales, Massachusetts, um, known as Whaleback Ridge. And in this photo, you can see Christopher standing uh, among a sea of oak regeneration, which is exactly what we want to see as foresters as we prepare for the next generation of oak trees in our forest. Um, another example of these workshops for professionals uh, was a Quabbin Reservoir webinar and field tour. Um, and this was testing a new type of hybrid event where we had a webinar and field tour combo um, where we hosted a two-part series um, on Oak Forest at the Quabbin um, with Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation's Division of Water Supply Protection and researchers from Harvard Forest and the UMass Amherst. Um, and the webinar was open to anyone who could attend um, with no cap on participants because we could do it safely from our own homes. But our field tour was limited to about 20 folks to really come together and talk about the, the challenges that they have with managing oak on the landscape and some of the opportunities that we have as well. Um, from Quabbin's perspective, it, the primary goal is to manage for the watershed. And so we want to be sure that the, the forest is there to help provide that quality of water that all the residents who um, rely on that water source are getting what they need. So next I'll talk about educational events for landowners. And initially landowner gatherings um, were supposed to take the form of stewardship summits, um, like what you see on the screen today. Um, however, uh, due to uh, events that <laughs> took place in March, 2020, we had to pivot and develop some new strategies for engaging these landowners. And so we've created some creative events um, for those, including a communicating with landowners about Oak Resiliency webinar, forest management from a landowner's perspective, which was a really interesting um, take, hearing a landowner talk about forest management and how they interact with their forester in the process. And I think it's a really great webinar to go back and, and watch to really, for a forester to watch it, um, 
figure out how they might want to talk to their clients and for a landowner, figure out how they want to talk with a forester that they want to hire to work with them on their property. Um, we also did a landowner town hall and follow up question in a um, web sessions um, and then an oak mini series for forest landowners. Um, and the mini series had episodes focused on wildlife, um, which featured Brian Hawthorne of Mass Wildlife, um, forestry um, and the, the planning processes around it with Fern Graves of the R Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and climate change, um, which featured a Andrea Urbano of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, so I'm going to stop here for the Oak Forest Resiliency Assessment Workshops and the assessment tool that we've been working on. Um, so working with the Forest Ecosystem Wandering Cooperative at the University of Vermont in the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, we've developed an Oak Resiliency Assessment Tool. Um, and this tool allows users to consider how resilient oak-dominated forest stands on a property are to climate change and various stressors. Um, users rate the degree to which certain impacts uh, affect the force and the adaptive capacity of the force to respond to the impacts. And based on the impacts and adaptive capacity ratings, the tool generates a report with an overall vulnerability score of low, medium, or high. Additionally, the report includes detailed descriptions of issues of concern in the forest and resistance, resilience, and transition pathways, which I won't spend too much time on, but just focusing on that resilience piece. What, what, can, what actions can we take to promote resiliency of oak forest into the future? Um, and so to get the tool in users' hands and train them how to use it, we're hosting a series of workshops geared for both foresters and landowners. We've held one official workshop to date um, with informal trainings interspersed in those, um, and we're planning more workshops for 2022. But just to focus on the tool a little bit, um, thinking about the impacts in adaptive capacity and how they generate a report that ends in an overall vulnerability score. So on the impact side, the big questions are the potential impacts likely to support or disrupt the health and function of the system. And these impacts include increases in extreme precipitation events, increases in storm frequency and intensity, elevated drought risk, elevated risk of wildfire, invasive plants, insects and forest pathogens, deer herbivory, a reduced habitat for northern tree species, higher sea levels and damage to forest roads and trails as well as an overall rating. So that explains all of the different impacts that we're trying to think about as we're managing you know, forest. And then on the adaptive capacity side, the big question is how resilient is the system to potential impacts? Um, the things that improve adaptive capacity include the forest condition and given the past land use, um, level of landscape connectivity, is it a big forest block or is it a fragmented forest block with a bunch of buildings around it? Um, overall tree health, um, species and structural diversity, ability to compete with more shade tolerant species like maple, birch and beech, ability to compete with invasive plants, um, the abundance of species adapted to current and expected future conditions, oak regeneration potential, and stewardship planning and implementation capacity as well as overall rating. So for all those impacts and adaptive capacities, there is a, a sliding scale on a one to five to rate rate how big of a deal the impact is or how big of a deal the adaptive capacity is, and they funnel into a, a, the tool to generate an overall vulnerability. And this is what the tool generates. Um, so overall site vulnerability for this test run that we had was moderate. And you can see the, the scale over here on the right. Um, so you have very supportive on impacts or very disruptive on impact. So a very disruptive, it means you're gonna have more of a higher vulnerability. Whereas if you're less disruptive, you'll be on the lower side of vulnerability. And same to be said for adaptive capacity. Either a low adaptive capacity means that you're gonna have uh, some issues to deal with or with a high adaptive capacity, um, you're, you're in good shape. And so where we wanna, where, where we wanna be is in that very supportive, of potential impacts and high adaptive capacity. If you're in that range, that's a great place to be. But if you're in any of these other moderate to, to high vulnerability phrases, uh, areas of this graph, um, you, you might wanna think about taking action. 
Um, and I just wanted to stop to recognize the tool development partners, including the Forest Stewards Guild, Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, and the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. Um, in fact, on Thursday this week, I'm going to be giving a brief talk at the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative's annual conference with a colleague of, from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science to share this with their community. Last, lastly, I want to talk about our regional oak forest resilience synthesis. Um, this is synthesis activities for the oak resiliency project is ongoing. And in 2022, as we look back at the entire three year project, we'll compile key findings to help continue the momentum developed from this project. But one place that you can look for all the resources developed during this project and additional ones that provide value are on the Forest Stewards Guild webpage um, for oak resiliency. And on this webpage, you can find our oak resiliency toolkit where you'll find outreach materials designed for forest landowners, communication resources for foresters, civil culture and field tools for foresters, wildlife resources, and research for understanding how oaks grow and how we can manage them. So how can you get involved? Whether you're a landowner, forester, other natural resource professional, or interested public, you can get involved with this project. A great place to start is by visiting our Oak Resiliency webpage, as I discussed on the previous slide, and explore the resources in the toolkit. And I'll share some of the key ones at the end of my presentation. Um, if you're a forest landowner, you can get in touch with your local service forester. That is a great place to start. Um, as is their job to help answer the questions that you have about your, your forest. Um, you can also join an oak resiliency assessment tool workshop and use the tool to help us collect data on oak resiliency throughout the region. So we get a full Southern New England look at how resilient or how vulnerable oak is across the, the Southern New England landscape. Um, and lastly, keep a lookout for Oak Resiliency focused events. Um, when we schedule an event, we advertise through many of our partner channels throughout Southern New England, and I'll be sure to share upcoming opportunities with Neff and the Mohawk Woodland Trail Partnership to be sure that everybody on this call can, can get involved. Um, that is all I had to present on. I am happy to answer questions at this point. Um, so thank you very much. Great, thank you, Logan. Wonderful. Um, I'm, whoops, I'm going to go back to a couple of questions that were um, expressed earlier that I think might um, be in your court. Let's see here, and I just lost it. Um, we have thunder going on here in the background in December, so hopefully we all stay connected for a few more minutes. Um, okay, there's Oak Shot. Well, okay. perhaps you could, oh, sorry, Lisa, did you find it? Yes. Um, okay. So, okay, uh, from Dave, do you and your colleagues have a vision of the ideal balance of oaks to other species in forests? Um, then it says, since of course the other native species do also matter. And then also mentions deer browse, which of course is a, a big issue, I think. But if you could address the balance perhaps, if that's something the, the group has looked at. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I, I appreciate it. And I want to go back to that paraphrased quote from Tom Wordley of Yukon. Um, if you manage for oak, you'll get oak in maple, birch, and beech, and all those other species that matter. Um, but if you don't manage for oak, you're at risk of losing oak from the landscape because of all the stressors on it. And so um, if we're really focusing on managing oak, then we, we have the ability to manage for all of those species that, that do matter. It's about a, a whole forested ecosystem rather than just the tree species a lot of the time. But that tree species is really important to keep on the landscape and we need to, we need to take action to make sure that it's there in the long term. Great, and now was there any particular emphasis on deer browse as part of um, yes. the assessment tool? Yes, so deer browse is an impact and ability to um, withstand deer browse as one of the adaptive capacities. So we were thinking about deer browse pretty significantly, but I've also heard other browse is also an issue from moose and turkey and, and the like. Um, and so in those workshops for professionals, we really talk a lot about deer browse and what we can do. Um, on a smaller scale, things like tree tubes when planting um, might be effective at keeping deer from, from munching on um, the nubs or, or the buds. Um, in other instances, fencing um, is a really expensive option, but it keeps deer out to allow that regeneration to get to a point where um, you can take the fence down and allow it to grow naturally. 
Um, and then one, one thing that's being tested throughout the region, including in New York and Cornell University is really leading the charge on this is slash walls, which if a timber harvest is to occur, use the residuals that, that are left on site to create a wall to keep deer out, to allow that, allow those seedlings and saplings to really get established. And then over time, the wall will decompose and then the, the wildlife will be able to gain access to that space again. Great. And um, I did have a question from a landowner that came in as from registration uh, mentioning, and this relates to what you commented on a bit, but uh, one problem I have noticed is that oaks seem to be pre preferred food for beavers and moose. When moose and beaver populations increase as they are now, I predict that oaks will become more and more difficult to find. I've seen beaver go right past nice alternative hardwoods so they can get to an oak, which they seem to favor. And what moose do to young oaks is frightening. So just one observation there. I don't know if you can comment on that at all. But. Yeah, um, I think my, my answer is gonna be similar to what it just was, but um, it's an issue. Uh, wildlife need the food as a resource, but we need to make sure that that resource is able to grow up and be an established oak tree. So it's providing mass, um, the, the acorns are provide a great food source too. So it's a great food source. We want to be sure it's on the landscape in the long run, but we recognize that that there's this delicate balance between wildlife impacts on oak and what can we do to make sure that we establish oak for the future now. Um, it, well, the, going back just a step, they're going to munch on the, the oak. Um, it, it's inevitable, um, but if we can protect some of those seedlings and get them up into the, into the canopy, um, then we're going to have better success in the future. Great. Okay, and um, if Desiree is still on, I, I don't know, this was another question, which I'm not sure you both can address, but um, somebody had a question about, um, you know, mentioning the importance of oak leaf litter. Any info yet on the possible effects of jumping worms on the forest, if and when they spread across the state? Do we really know for certain that they are as bad as some people say? And I don't know if you, either of you can address that question or not, but. I'm happy to let Desiree address the question, and if she doesn't have a <laughs> response, I can I can do my darndest. Uh, yeah, I don't know if my if my answer will be uh, satisfactory. I mean, in addition to jumping worms, most of you know most of the earthworms that are out there, the majority of them are invasive, and they are a big problem for leaf litter. I work in a in a forest that in Springfield that. If you move like a like a half a meter of leaf litter, you can pick up like, um, you know, 25 earthworms and actually none of them are jumping worms. They're all the um, um, uh, European nightcrawler. I, for I forget the scientific name for it. Um, but part of that is because we don't have that balance in the ecosystem. Right. So we we want to have. Um, a more robust native insect community that can keep those earthworms down. We want to like reduce the introductions of those earth earthworms into the ecosystem. And we need to have trees that are going to be able to support, that are going to provide this huge volume of leaf litter as well. So again, I mean, we have so many things happening. There's, there's so much stuff, but the more intact habitat that you have, the less likely that those earthworms are gonna overwhelm. It's when we have these tiny, small forest fragments and we extirpate the uh, native insects and bird species to help keep those populations down, that's when, we, that's when they get out of control, really. So the, probably one of the best things that you can do is expand the amount of natural forest that you have as, and connect it as best as possible. Great, thank you. Um, and here is just a comment from Dave. Last weekend, we discovered our first woodland white oak tree in Heath that we had seen in 27 years of spending time in that town. We were very excited to say the least. <laughs> <Woo -hoo>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there was a comment from um, John, um, and this is like a forestry related comment. It looks like the shift in tree species composition for, from oak to maples primarily red maple that Desiree spoke of results in large part selective or high grade cutting that does not open adequate canopy gaps to regenerate shade intolerant oaks. And I'm not sure if either of you wants to address that, but it's a comment. Oh yeah, I, so I'm, I'm so glad that you provide that clarification on, on the point that I made because that, that's exactly the point that I wanted to make is that 
the, the tree communities that we have now are novel, like regardless of whether you're in the inner city, a uh, small hill town or way out in the middle of intact forests. They're completely novel. And that's all due to our decisions that we made or the decisions that our ancestors made hundreds, a hundred years ago. Um, and so, so really it just goes to show uh, the importance of you, you know, carefully thinking about how you're going to manage your land uh, going into the future. Um, because you can, you know, if you want oak habitat because you feel that it's important, you can make those choices uh, to, you know, conserve it and promote it into the future. Great. Um, we have so, um, a couple oh, a ahead, question. Kate. Yeah. Um, John asks, somehow the oak forests in Massachusetts and elsewhere managed themselves fine before the pilgrims arrived. Why do they need our management now? I think I'm best to answer that question. Um, so, Yes, the, the forests were, were in good shape um, before colonizers arrived in North America. But what is important to recognize is there were indigenous peoples in these landscapes stewarding the forest. And while it might have been a different type of stewardship, it was happening. And so they were on the landscape burning. Um, things were happening. And just because there wasn't this intense timber management that ha happened after the fact doesn't mean that they weren't managed before. Um, and they, they were just managed differently. And then as we look to the future, um, these forests are really new. Um, we really cleared the forests over time. And so this is a, a next generation of forests that has grown up and that they, they need to be stewarded in a way for, uh, for us to promote those resiliencies. Because our land use history has been so poor, we, we need to really re rehabilitate these forests to make them, make them more resilient for the future. Because if you have an overstocked area, then, then you're just stagnating the forest and they're not going to grow and they're not going to capture as much carbon as you want them to. And so you need to go in and remove some to enhance the growth of the forest over time. Okay. That was a great answer. <laughs> just wanted to say that. Yeah. And just reiterate, like, this is just a completely novel ecosystem than the one that was experienced pre-colonization. Like we have different soil chemistries. We have different temperatures. Like in addition to climate change, if you look at just land use change and landscape level, level development, um, it, 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 it puts so much different um, conditions for these forests uh, to have to deal with that you know it's it, it's in our best interest to be stewards it's in our best interest to care for our environment in a way that supports us that supports ecosystems wildlife um there's something good to be said about that you know we don't want to say we're going to control everything although in some cities that kind of has to happen but um you know we want to get to a point of stability but it's going to need a little bit of help to get there okay yeah, and um, just to continue sure. on this thought, we could we could probably talk uh, about this question the the rest of the time, and uh, I, I'd be happy to. But I also want to be respectful of everyone else's um, questions. Um, but just one thing I want to say is, professionals like me have dedicated our lives to to understanding this topic, and they in most can cases, they're doing what they think is best for the forest in the future. So um, I, I just want to throw out a shout out to the people that are making this work happen and th their, their desire to um, increase the resiliency of these forests. Great. Um, and then somebody mentioned that um, on the jumping worm issue, there is a workshop coming up in January, apparently at UMass, which I do have some information about, not at the tip of my tongue, but we can try to include that in the follow-up resources that we send out. Apparently it's two whole days of research about jumping worms if folks want to dig in on that. Um, that sounds yeah. very exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't <Yeah>. wait. <sighs> um, okay, and I don't know, let's see if, so, are there other Dickon questions? Dickon has a I question yeah. that might be best for Logan about specific oak management. Um, he's talking about the Wendell, the aforementioned Wendell harvest. It sounds like you're saying that reproduction of oak is the challenge to having oak in the future. The goal of thinning in Wendell was to promote the growth of large, vigorous oaks while creating openings that oaks can successfully reproduce in. Do you agree with this approach? Um, without kind of knowing the, the forest management plan and the operation strategy there, um, that, that sounds like it makes sense to me. Um, 
Desiree brought up the term structure earlier, and I think that that's really important. Um, one of our project partners at the Norcross Wildlife Sanctuary, um, they were they did an oak oak um, inventory, um, including the seedlings, so things below six feet tall, um, saplings, things above six feet tall, but not quite in the canopy yet, and overstory canopy, which is everything over five inches in diameter at diameter. And so what they found was they had a lot of seedlings and they had a lot of overstory oak, but they didn't have a lot of that sapling oak. And so they're missing that layer of the forest. And so by creating those openings, you're allowing light to reach the forest floor to generate more of those seedlings in hopes to get them up to that sapling stage while maintaining the overstory oak canopy. So you're really managing for two objectives there. You're managing for the current current forest condition now, and you're managing for the current, uh, the, the future forest condition um, that you're looking for, which is a heavy oak dominated forest. Um, and in those oak dominated forests, you get all the other hardwoods that you're looking for, maple, birch, and beech. But with oak losing ground, we want to make sure oak has, has that ground to, to thrive. Um, I'm, I'm going to share an anecdote um, that is not New England, but I think is relevant. So I so prior to doing my graduate work, I worked on a very extensive um, forest experiment managing for cerulean warbler, which is a mature forest, um, uh, you know, um, oak associated uh, warbler species more southerly than here. But um, we were, you know, it was really kind of incredible. So all the points that Logan's making about allowing sunlight to hit the floor so that oaks can regenerate are completely true. And I can say, you know, from my experience, some of these uh, harvests, so like things like shelter wood harvest, where we, where we leave mature trees behind to be the mother trees for the next generation. Um, and then we create all of these, these uh, smaller gaps for the sunlight to come in are are, are extremely productive. After a, a couple of years past that harvest, the trees just go bananas with growth. There's lots of vertical structured structural diversity and heterogeneity of habitat that allows for a lot of, um, uh, for insect populations to thrive, for the birds that rely on those insect populations to go bananas. And so species that we typically associate with interior forests will actually utilize those um, those cut areas very heavily because there's lots of cover for shelter, there's lots of food for reproduction. Um, and so, you know, it's it's it can be, we need to have that kind of heterogeneity in the landscape as well in order to promote a diverse wildlife um, going into the future. And so I like the way that Logan framed it in, in like managing for the mother trees and then also managing for the for those next um, generations as well. That can be an extremely valuable um, approach. In that kind of along those same lines um, with time frame, um, Logan, maybe you can speak to someone's um, concern that an acre of 100 year old unharvested trees absorbs many times the amount of carbon dioxide that an acre of five year olds. So perhaps you can speak a little bit to the time frame of our woods and how um, that is going, what's going on with that. Yeah, thanks for that question. And, and that's a great one. I did drop in the chat a window a uh, Science of Carbon Forestry webinar that the Forest Stewards Guild hosted um, in April this year, um, featuring Bill Keaton of the University of Vermont, who is an international expert on old growth forests and carbon carbon sequestration and storage. But just to back up to uh, onto the on the topic a little bit, there's there's a difference between sequestration, the rate in which trees bring in carbon, and storage, the amount of carbon a tree is storing. And so we need to separate those two points. And the research shows that sequestration, the rate in which carbon is captured, is actually higher in younger trees. That's because they're trying to really bring in that carbon to put on growth. Once they're older, they're storing a lot more carbon. So those older oak trees are storing a lot of carbon, but they've really kind of plateaued on terms of how much they can bring in at a time. And so just understanding that difference is really important. Um, a younger forest is going to capture more carbon quickly, but an older forest is going to store carbon over the long term. Um, but one really important aspect of this in terms of storing carbon is 
um, take the forest management examples we've been talking about where you remove some of the oak um, in favor of increasing the regeneration of oak and allowing the, the trees that remain to grow larger and capture more carbon. That oak is then transformed into a wood product that is also storing carbon. And so there's really all of these intense dynamics going on around carbon forestry and a lot of things to balance out. Um, just to, to back up even further, I got into forestry because I was interested in the carbon world. And the more I learned, the more I understand that we need to check off a lot of boxes in order to really make the forest be its best at capturing and storing carbon for the long term. And so some of these strategies are getting at that. Great. Um, there was one other point related to what you were talking about a minute ago, but um, Dawn asked, should we prune other trees nearby to allow oaks to have more space? And of course, this may be um, dependent on the site specifics, but if you can comment on that at all. So space for, for oak trees. Um, pruning, um, just definitionally, no, um, because pruning is removing limbs. Um, thinning is the term that we use in forestry for creating space. Um, and so a crop tree is the tree that you're going to leave on site to continue to grow. Um, in silviculture, which is the art and science of forestry, um, you want to create space and eventually a stand will get to a point where the canopy closes and all the branches are touching. And when all those branches are touching, there's not a whole lot of room for the trees to continue to grow. And so by thinning a few trees out, you'll allow that one crop tree to grow larger. That's just one specific example. And a lot of instances in forestry, which I haven't said yet, is the answer is it depends. And you should talk to a forester about what options are best for your land. And, you know, in, in, in heavily developed areas, too, there is something to be said about having trees growing in groves rather than singly, because that can help them to be more stable in uh, a soil system and be more resilient to a big weather uh, system that comes in uh, versus a single tree that only has its own roots to keep it um, uh, in the soil. So, uh, yeah, like, like Logan said, it depends. There's nuance. Uh, for your condition on how you might want to manage it. That's um, funny because uh, Pat says, in my experience, mm -hmm. oak tend to show much more decline when they compete with other oaks and they compete really well against other trees if they have a head start. So there goes your idea of site-specific conditions, right? Um, everything being so site-specific. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, what is the definition of decline for you? So if is it they're not growing fast enough? Is it, I mean, I would be surprised if they were dying because they're growing next to each other. So maybe it's just that the the time frame that you're observing hasn't really reached the full potential of that of that small oak community. Great. Um, I think unless I'm missing anything and others can uh, point out if I am, but I think we might have covered most of the questions here. So if anybody has any final um, things they want to ask in the chat, um, or if uh, Logan or Desiree have any other points they wanted to revisit. Well, one point I wanted to revisit was um, Oak, Oak's projections in a warming climate. Um, so we work closely with the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, as, as I've mentioned, and they're, they're responsible for some pretty neat publications on winners and losers and, and projections for climate change. And, and Oak is, is projected to do well in a warmer climate. However, you have all these other stressors that are in there too. So it's really hard to figure out how successful something's going to be if you don't know what the next pest coming in is going to, going to be. So um, we really want to make sure that it's secure um, regardless of future conditions. Um, yes, it, it might thrive, but those other species, maple especially, is taking up a lot of room and, it, and is really getting a stronghold in the region. And so other species have a chance to outcompete it too. And, and just to add to that, so, you know, there's lots of different spe species of trees where we have, like, incredible um, disturbance that's happening. So, like, emerald ash borer and, um, uh, you know, what, what I forgot what I was trying to say. Oh, yeah. I meant to say that 
part of the resilience of these tree populations is having the populations to seed individuals that might be resilient to those changes. So we know, like, for example, in ashes, that not every ash tree dies, right? Some of them are actually fine and they get emerald ash borer and then they deal with it and they grow and they're all right. And so if we preemptively remove a lot of those trees from the landscape, then we're removing the genetic diversity that we need for a population to bounce back from disturbances. And so that's one of the things that we can think about for oak trees, because you're right, we don't know what's going to come in in the future. And like, unfortunately, those sort of introductions are inevitable. But we, if we have, I mean, we're going to try to get people to not do that. But, you know, if we have nice, stable populations with genetic diversity, um, you know, that's going to help those oak populations be more resilient into the future as well, no matter what happens. Great. Um, here is another question um, that popped up from Janet. Any prospects for reintroducing wolves and mountain lion to curb deer overpopulation? And I don't know if you, if you can address that. So uh, do you want to take a look at it or I'll, I'll take it? You, you can take it if you, if you I don't know. Know. I Well, it. yeah, okay. So um, people have a lot of feelings about wolves and mountain lions. Um, in places where wolves have populations that are um, doing okay, not good, but okay, uh, there's a lot of pushback about that. So whether they'll be introduced to this area, I feel like will be a pretty big long shot uh, for a long time into the future. And we also like don't have tremendous amount of intact habitat to support the kind of uh, territories that these uh, large carnivores need. But that said, I mean, there are mountain lions that are dispersing from um, increasing populations in South Dakota and they're making their way, but they have a whole Midwest to get past before they get here. So I think it's going to be a really long time before we have natural dispersal. And I think that social pushback is going to also, um, uh, you know, get in the way of any intentional introductions of these species. Um, and so right now, we can't rely on that for deer control. We need to do human interventions. And yeah, and just to build off that, I want to reiterate the point of humans. The, the, this is a very densely populated landscape, mm -hmm. even in the more rural areas of southern New England. It's still densely populated compared to Midwest states and, and further further out west. So um, reintroducing a species like that that has human implications to it is really um, it's a really big policy challenge that that would need to get worked out. Um, but there are coyotes in the landscape, and they are doing yeah. pretty well. So I'm sure that they're doing their fair share of controlling deer populations. Um, and I know that they, they've been getting bigger and um, more healthy populations. So um, that, that's something to consider as a proxy in that instance. Okay. Um, and here is another question. Um, can you briefly talk about the hemlock and uh, hemlock woolly adelgid? Are we making progress to save these trees? If you have any thoughts on that specific. So hemlock woolly adelgid, um, it's really cold dependent. Um, and so it really went through the mid-Atlantic states really quickly because the, they didn't have those cold winter temperatures that really kill off the insect. Um, and so Massachusetts, I think, is a little bit more in that colder, colder region. So it's going slower, but it's still happening and will continue to happen. Where I live in Maine, um, it's kind of hit the coast um, where it's, the temperatures are a little bit more regulated, but it's having trouble making its way inland um, because of those colder temperatures. And so it's really cold dependent. Um, I, I'm not really sure what there is to do in terms of management. Um, it's a really, really delicate, delicate issue, but um, unfortunately, it's not looking, looking promising. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that, except that um, my personal experience with having hemlock woolly diligent on my hemlock trees um, 
And our UMass extension had had mentioned that for a lot of the trees that are in this in this westerly region are able to handle these low densities. And we had so much dispersal of woolly uh, of of adelgids. They they hop on birds, they hop on mammals, they do all kinds of things. So it's really really it's extremely hard to control, even more so than something like emerald ash borer um, or lamantria. Um, and so. Um, yeah, it can have it can really transform hemlock ecosystems, um, and I can't speak to whether we can make progress on it, except to again try to cultivate populations that um, have that genetic diversity, so that we have individuals that can withstand uh, low density uh, populations. Great. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions and um, Kate and Beth, unless you see anything else that you want to address, um, we're, and we're about at 1130. So if there's any final thoughts, you can enter it in the chat, but I think we'll probably wrap up because this was sort of our expected time frame. Anything else um, to add? I'm not seeing other questions. So I just want to thank um, Desiree and Logan so much for sharing your expertise with us this morning and um, appreciate everybody joining us. It seemed like with the weather outside, it was a good day for a virtual walk through, <laughs> through the Oaks. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, we will be uh, posting um, the recording of the webinar today and we'll, we'll share that with everybody who registered and for folks who couldn't be here in person this morning and um, share any other resources that our speakers have to offer too. So you can check out their websites and learn more. And I uh, just wanna thank everyone for coming and um, have a wonderful rest of your day today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care.